our dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for us being able to come back together to continue the study on being blessed and the Christian attributes that it contains. Be this now, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Greetings. Welcome back, back to Amos Seed and Feed in part two of our mini series within Lessons from Iceland about being blessed. The picture we see with regards to the waterfall, the name of it is Jalparfas. Again, it's, it's an Icelandic name, so I'm not sure whether or not I've actually pronounced it correctly. But if we look at it, the first part, it actually is translated into the word help. And then the F-O-S-S -S is falls for waterfall. And the history behind this is, near here, there's a, a very large section of land that is very desolate, like a desert. It's covered with volcanic ash, because it's near Hecla, and it is covered with volcanic rock, uh, old lava flows. And when Icelandics would actually travel that route on horseback, it was... Uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, it took like a day or two to get across there. And so when they reached the waterfall, it was like an oasis. It was a, a, a place of refreshing. There was grass that grew there, and there were, there's of course the water that's clear and, and pure. And the interesting thing about it too is that even though it's clear and pure and everything around it is desolate, and this is like an oasis, the waterfall itself was actually, I believe, was actually created by or cut through the rock to be the twin waterfalls by lava flow from one of the Hecla eruptions. And so it's, it's quite an interesting story behind that. But as we look at this as being an oasis, let's go into our next section here with regards to our blessed are they and the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5. The first one that we're going to, the first one we're going to cover today is actually more of a personal one like the first three we studied in our last lesson. This one is about our desire being our hungry, hunger for our Lord. So if we turn to Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 it reads, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. That's where our hunger should lie. And so we need to be of the same light. The physical body, yes, we need to eat. We need to maintain it. We need to nourish it so that it'll, it'll live and survive and we may continue our work for Christ. But we should actually have another hunger and thirst, which is for our Lord. If we turn to John chapter 6, verse 35, it reads, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We can look at this two ways. First, let's look at it from those who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. He's telling that if you don't want to hunger in eternity, you don't want to thirst eternally, you need to come and accept Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the only way you're going to quench the thirst and hunger, hunger that we have. You're not going to find it in this world anywhere. You're not going to find it in the lust of the flesh and the stealing and all the things you can garnish in this, land, in this, in this life, such as houses and cars and money, none of that is going to quench your thirst and hunger. Only Jesus Christ will. Now as a Christian, we should be looking to satisfy that thirst and hunger through righteousness. And we do that by reading, studying, and meditating in God's Word, as we already discussed, and in applying it and living it out in our lives. That is how we satisfy the thirst and hunger that we have. It has a far much greater satisfying power than like we just discussed. Money and cars and houses and things and, and do partying and whatever else there may be. None of those things have any impact whatsoever except Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the water of life. Proverbs 19, 15 through 16. Slothfulness cast us into a deep sleep and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despises his way shall die. Here we see a contrasting verse in that first part. Slothfulness cast us into a deep sleep, and the idle soul suffer hunger. There again, 
if we're idle in our Christianity, we're going to suffer hunger. And it says, after that, he that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul. But then it goes on to say again, in the negative, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. So in other words, those who do not practice their Christianity can suffer hunger and suffer thirst. As the body requires nourishment to eat by eating and drinking, so our souls require the same thing. Again, reading, studying, and meditating, and doing those things that Christ has called us to do. All those things satisfy that hunger and thirst. If we don't do those things, eventually, just like someone physically who goes in a starvation, to starvation uh, event, after a certain number of days, they're going to die because they don't have the nourishment they need to sustain their lives. And so, even in the spiritual realm, we are the same way. We may survive for a while, but eventually we're going to die because we're not feeding it and satisfying the thirst as we should in order for it to continue to live. The next thing we're going to go ahead and cover is the topic, forgiveness. It is our duty. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. This is kind of a hard one for us to actually grasp and hold. It is something that is more external now than what the first form of the Beatitudes that we discussed. And if we turn to Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36, we're going to read, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. Ye shall be the children of the highest, and... For, his, for he is kind unto, unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is in heaven. So here at the end of this, we actually see where we, sh we are commanded to be merciful as our Father in heaven who is merciful. Again, speaking to those who are of Christ, those who accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And there is a, a reward within that, in that... Um, we, again, will be blessed. It is the highest form of um, f highest form of being blessed we can have. Um, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so, basically it says here, love your enemies, do good to those that, do, that don't do well to you. And then, also those who are unthankful, those that do evil toward us. We should be merciful toward them, as our Father in Heaven is also merciful to us. So in other words, we live our life out. They may not. They may be evil to us, but our life will reflect Jesus Christ. And maybe one day the light will turn on that they may actually see that there's something that they need through Jesus Christ that they've observed within our and within our lives by our being merciful as a Father in heaven who is also merciful and gave us Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 11 verses 17 through 18. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. But he that is cruel troubleth his old flesh. The wicked worketh a deceitful work. But to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Here again, Proverbs is great about the idea of showing the high side and the low side, the light and the dark. As it begins, the merciful man doeth good to his own soul. Giving mercy to those around us, it does good for our soul too. It's not just for, for those outside of us. The opposite of merciful is being cruel. What's it say? Those who are cruel are also going to trouble their own flesh. It's going to impact us not just spiritually, but physically as well. And then it goes on to the next one. The wicked work with work of the deceitful work. That's what they do. Those that don't know Christ, that's what they do. And then the very last part. But to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. So in other words, if we are sowers of what we've already learned in the Beatitudes and doing those things that are righteous unto God and being obedient to, to the, His command for us in our lives, we shall have a sure reward. It's guaranteed here. Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 through 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
So it's pretty straightforward here. Forgiveness is key when we're talking about being merciful. There will be those that will hurt us verbally, hurt us physically, hurt us financially, hurt us in our job, hurt us in so many different ways. But we, but we should always forgive. And here the command is, God will forgive us if we forgive others. He gives us that command. But if we don't forgive anybody, He's not going to forgive us. There's actually a passage of Scripture, a, a, a proverb that Christ talks about where there was a servant that was forgiven a huge amount. But then he went and beat his servants to get money from them, not forgiving them as even his master forgave him. And so ultimately he was cast in the, into the prison so that he would pay everything that he owed his, his master. And so that's what this passage of Scripture is actually speaking of, in that we need to forgive as God forgave us. The next one we're actually going to talk about is cleansing ourselves. And this is a form of obedience. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We need to cleanse ourselves. I know, like for instance here, I've got glasses. If I'm working in a garage and a piece of wood and sawdust is flying all over and whatever else, it gets to the point where I can't see very well. And if we convert this over into what we're talking about here in a spiritual level, pure, being cleansed, if I don't, if I don't clean my glasses, my spiritual glasses, I'm not going to see God. I need to cleanse my life. I need to see those things that are in my life based on the reading, studying, and meditating in God's Word, identifying those items that are in my life that I need to get rid of and do away with them and cleanse my life so that I may see, see God. And the more we cleanse ourselves, the more of God that will be revealed unto us. Think of that. Let's go to James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. In the very beginning of this, resist the devil. How do we resist the devil? We do those things, not what the devil asks us to do or wants us to do, and what the world wants us to do. We do those things that God wants us to do, the things that we're commanded to do. In so doing, we cleanse our hands and we purify our hearts. If we don't do those things, we don't cleanse our hands and we don't purify our hearts. And then at the very last, it says you're minded Think of it this way. Many people nowadays who call themselves Christians do the things of the world Monday through Saturday. And on Sunday, they do the things that are considered godly by going to church, giving their money, and, and doing those things that they feel are get them out of the bad spot. Trying to gain approval of God when reality is that it requires seven days a week, 24 hours a day to accomplish that. So we shouldn't be double-minded. In other words, living in two worlds. Living in the world, but then trying to live a life of Christ. You can't do, this, do both. You need to either resist the devil, and he will flee from us, or just continue in the world. That's the, that's the only two choices we have. There is, no, there is no double way of actually doing that and being acceptable. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The very last part of this is speaking to us. We are not born of corruptible seed as Christians. We are born of incorruptible. Jesus Christ was absolutely, totally, completely without sin. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. Accepting Him as Savior, we are now born again, not in corruption anymore, but in incorruption through Jesus Christ our Lord that we may, may live and abide forever with, our, with God. Now, in the beginning, they begin to talk about purifying our souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Many of these things that we are called to do, we can't do them by ourselves. But the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit to live in us and to guide us. 
some people would cons- would uh, equate the Holy Spirit with our conscience, letting us know that you know what you really shouldn't do that, or if you see something, hey, why don't you go over and see if you can't help with that? The Holy Spirit helping along the way to help us live a better life, to live a good life, to live a life of Christ in purifying our souls. And it says, love one another. Wow. Do we love one another? That's kind of a tall order. It's just simple words. But do we actually love one another? Like the last verse, loving our enemies. Do you love your enemies? That's a tough one. Think on that. Now the last one we're going to cover today is making peace with our Lord, but also with others. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by, Christ, by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. As you can see, this, is a, this was a mouthful, even I stumbled on it a couple times. But all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Christ Jesus. In other words, that is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. In so doing, we are now reconciled to God, and things are made right between us. Our relationship is now reconnected to Christ. Because God, when He looks at us, He looks through His Son's blood that He had shed for us on the cross. And the fact that He rose again conquering death. That's how God now sees us if we accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Now once we have done that, we now have, as, as the passage says, it says we now have a ministry. To reconcile. How do we do that? We are to continually reconcile ourselves with God. But at the same time, we are to help others by leading them to Christ, to help them reconcile their relationship with God. And then in so doing, it reconciles, even in a physical manner, we can reconcile our differences in the physical world as well. Like, for instance, I actually remembered uh, John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, he spent a lot of time in jail because he was preaching the gospel. And it was a judge, because of the law, he was following the law, and he was putting John Bunyan in prison. Well, not long before John Bunyan had, 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 had died, the judge called, called upon John Bunyan to come and help reconcile him with his son. And so John Bunyan did just that. Even though the judge was evil against him from the standpoint, he put him in jail because he preached the gospel, John Bunyan recognized the fact that this was his duty, this was his ministry. And so he went to the judge, to his house, and his son was there and helped him reconcile the differences and and redevelop and put that relationship of father and son back together. Now, the ministry, it was so important. Now, think of, this, think of this part. John Bunyan, on his way home, was caught in a, a downpour when he actually did this, going to the judge's house and going home. He became very ill and actually passed away from that illness. But it didn't, he didn't shirk, shirk his duties and ministry of reconciliation. That was first and foremost. All things are of God. And he did those things that God called him to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now we graduate. From, from just being someone that does re- reconciliation, but being an ambassador. What do ambassadors do? Ambassadors are those that actually go between nations, and they help hold the peace. They 
communicate back and forth, making sure that relationship is cohesive so that nothing spawns from that, such as war or tribulation or any of those nature, nature all those or any of those things of nature. And so even in our Christian walk we are to be ambassadors of Christ. Going to those, telling them of Christ, helping them reconcile a relationship with God by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and being an ambassador. And even from the standpoint, those who are already Christians, are they sliding away? Our job is to be the ambassador to help redevelop and reconnect that relationship with Christ so that they may, again, live a life of Christ and be righteous in His eyes. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 25. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. This passage of scripture actually shows the importance of re reconciliation. It is more important to make sure that you fix those relationships than it is to go to church. It is more important to reconcile those differences than putting offering in an offering plate. It is more important to reconcile the differences, to fix those issues and problems that are there. And so it is, even like we already discussed, the reconciliation ultimately is with Christ. We need to be in the right mindset, in the right place, so that we may properly serve our Lord and Savior. And the only way to do that is to reconcile ourselves both with God and man. So this concludes part two of the three parts that we have on the Beatitudes. And I hope you found it interesting and helpful. As, as, as just a reminder, we discuss those things that are internal, that are our responsibility, and it is a personal thing that we must take care of. And then the last ones that we just, just discussed, it has to do with the relationship outside of us, but we can only accomplish those things by taking care of the things on a personal level. Think on those things. And we will see you in part three. Take care.